and you set your goals internally and externally and you really just clear that smoke out of the air and you got to move forward and you can't you can't look back and keep looking in your rearview mirror Welcome to another episode of the Sports Business Podcast. Today, we have Paul Fioroni. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, welcome, Tangier. Uh, I, I really appreciate it, man. Very excited. I've been uh, listening to quite a few of your episodes, actually, and it's, I'm pretty impressed. You know, there needs to be more of this done and, you know, to get a lot of people's voices out there. And I love your passion, uh, you know, really trying to share that. Absolutely. It means the world and glad to have you on. And now I know... Um, we got a few things in common. We're both Canadians living in Texas <laughs> yeah. and, uh, we are both former athletes. So, um, so let's start there, Paul. How, how was your, uh, what brought you to Texas and maybe even a little earlier than that? Uh, what was your sports career? Like, where did you play and that whole story? Yeah. So my, my father actually was an Italian soccer player. He uh, migrated to Toronto. Uh, I met my mother's, uh, Scotch Irish family there and, uh, Big Italian Irish Roman Catholic family, five brothers, and and uh, we ended up uh, playing a lot of my minor hockey there in in the, the Sarnia Guelph kind of southern Ontario area. Um, you know, had some chances to play junior there. My my father moved out west, so I was a part of the, uh, the WHL Western Hockey League draft, going out to Medicine Hat in Saskatoon, and um, <clears throat> kind of went through there. And, and really, I was able to play with the uh, Calgary Triple A Flames and win a Max Midget tournament, which was uh, Pretty neat deal. And then uh, went from there to my junior career with the Olds Grizzlies and, and then went to the Chilliwack Chiefs and and then uh, finally migrated south to the U.S. trying to chase a pro dream and um, had a great career, you know, over essentially 10, 11 years and 600 games and uh, finally called it quits in 06 and decided to jump into the world of business. Wow. So how was, you know, we had a few, uh, you know, NHL and ECHL players on the podcast and they always um, talk about how difficult it was balancing school because you were actually playing hockey at a really young age and a lot of guys don't go to school. Right. What was that for you? I know you were bouncing around to city to city for a while. Yeah, well, you know, my dad's a big education guy. You know, I, grad, I was able to graduate high school early at 17. Um, and then, you know, when I was in Olds, I was able to go to Olds College there and, and pick up my school as I moved on. I, I tried not to uh, put it in my rear view mirror, but keep it in front of me and, you know, I know a lot of players and teammates of mine that, you know, were able to go back. And that's the beautiful thing about education. You can always go back to it. Um, but with hockey, it's tough for sure. You know, when you're, especially when you're in the minors and you're, and you're moving from city to city. And if you're, you're not kind of at that place where you are educationally, it, it can be very difficult. Yeah. So, so you, and actually another point, um, my uncle lives in Chilliwack. So I've been there a few times. It's a beautiful right. city. It is. Um, it's amazing. Um, so you, you so you played hockey. You um, you went you went to the U.S. for the pro dream. Mm -hmm. um, how was that transition like? When did you know that you were done with hockey? Well, you know, I, I kind of kicked myself in the butt a little bit. I, I really wanted to play NCAA Division One college hockey, and um, you know, the SATs were there. I, you know, I think because of my size and the type of player that I was. I was so attracted to, you know, and I guess the confidence level that I, I had, that I had, I really thought I had a better chance to, to go straight to, you know, straight to the pros. And my dream was to play for Notre Dame. I, I would have been my dream, my dream hockey school mm -hmm. to play at. Um, and I also had a great chance to play for Lethbridge as well in the CAU. And um, I, I kind of kicked myself in the butt. I actually have some old teammates of mine that ended up playing there and they won a, a national championship there, obviously, oh, a couple yeah. years later. So. Um, things happen for a reason, you know, God yeah, puts us on a path for a reason. And um, it was for me, it was to come down south and, and play pro hockey and and uh, cut my teeth in the business world and, and put me where I'm at right now for a reason. So what do you what did you do after hockey ended in 06? So I, I, I kind of just started a consulting company and it was called Filotech Sales Group. But I was able to partner up with a, a company called Interim Healthcare. Um, they're one of the largest home health agencies in the world. Um, there was a, a local group uh, here in Lubbock, Texas, where, where I had ended up finishing my career with the double-A team, the Cotton Kings. And <clears throat> the, the family was the Bullards, uh, Jim and Jason Bullard, this wonderful man, uh, this incredible mentors. And then that field mm -hmm. of essential medical sales, uh, the understanding of, of health care and, and, and really just a multifaceted sources within that realm. And I learned a lot there for a few years and, and really kind of cut my teeth on that side of it. 
And from there, that's where though my whole striker beginning started. Um, I had some very good friends of mine with some of the surgeons that um, I was working with <clears throat> that really helped me out with that. Uh, one in particular guy that actually became a business partner of mine down the road. Um, but, uh, you know, I, that's, the striker thing was pretty, pretty intense. You know, it, uh, I, don't, I don't think people understand the, number one, the hiring process to get, get through there. And then also the training. It's very, very extensive. And, you know, especially on the spine ortho side, I mean, you, they expect the best and they, and they really give you the best to become the best salesperson that you can be. And it is, to me, it's still, I think it's still the top of the food chain for people to get involved, at least on, on a sales standpoint, financially, challenging wise. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I went through the process, was able to get the job and was kind of thrown into the fire with Stryker. Um, you know, the, the training was very intense. I had to jump in a bunch of pathology and anatomy that I hadn't seen since you know, high school and college. Yeah. Um, but it was, I'll tell you, it really, it really lit a fire in my belly. You know, I was, it was just that whole thing, like being on the ice again and that, that competition, like, can I do this? Am I, am I smart enough to do this? Is this, is this challenge good enough for me? Yeah. I'll tell you, I went at it full heartedly and did very, very well with it. Um, and was able to take a territory and essentially double and triple it and, and get into management from there. And I uh, moved on to another great company, K2M, who I think is, you know, is one of the most innovative companies other than the one that I, I'm currently working with right now, Spinar USA. But, um, you know, I made some really neat transitions and learned a lot. Um, I had some great mentors, um, <clears throat> some of them that I still work with today. And, you know, the, the bar in that industry, that medical industry, it is a networking relational industry. I mean, it is incredible how big in a small world it is much like what we're doing right now, sports people that are in business. Yeah. It's a very intimate society, you know, and, and I love the support that everybody gives each other for that. So you said when you went to Stryker, it, it, you know, put a fire in your belly again. What were some of the things that you brought over from the ice in that, in that new world of yours? Oh man, it's, I'll tell you, hockey really prepared me for it. And I'll, <laughs> one thing that blew me away, my first national sales meeting I went to for Stryker, I could not believe the amount of hockey players and athletes that Stryker had hired. Wow. I mean, you could probably put together a very good men's league team of ex-professional athletes for hockey. I mean, Greg Crozier, right? Crowley, uh, Trevor Roenick. I mean, they had some really, really good hockey players that were exceptional business people as well. I mean, they all were excelling and were all presidents, council president selection guys. Um, but it really, this the work ethic, I think was one of the biggest yep. parts. You know, in Chilliwack, Coach Harvey Smeal, you know, he was, uh, you know, Stan Smeal, his brother, obviously was a big Vancouver Canuck guy. And, um, you know, he was just this, a massive general of hard work. You know, we always sell work teams. We may not have had all the skill, but I'll tell you, the teams are very intimidated by us and we all work teams all the time. So that obviously the leadership aspect, you know, I've been very blessed to, you know, to be in a captain situation with all the teams that I was with. I mean, my first year professional, I became an assistant captain through some turmoil with the team that I played for. And, you know, the leadership piece was was, was a big part. Just the whole, the team sense, that family bond, the camaraderie, yeah. um, you know, the kind of the brotherhood part of it, of getting involved, um, helping each other out. Um, you know, that, that stuff stayed very, very intense on the striker side. And just, just having a tough mind aspect. I mean, the mental part of it is when you're going into ORs with neurosurgeons, that are challenging you every day. Uh, you have your management challenging you every day and you've got to really mentally be very tough. And I think the game of hockey really, really set that in stone for me. Uh, you said it well, and you're going to get a lot of rejection, at least yeah. in the beginning, right? Absolutely. Um, and that stuff scares the hell out of people. Yeah. And, and I think coming from the hockey background that you did come from, um, you're used to that. You're used to getting rejected. You're used to getting your uh, your coach yelling at you, your players beating you every practice. Right. But all you can do is get back up and go back after it. Right. And Absolutely. And translate that back into the business world. You know, I, I read a book from uh, Seth God and Lynchpin. And, yeah. you know, sports is in general, and I think hockey more so than others, is a very passionate sport. Mm -hmm. You know, and he has a quote that, you know, says people with passion find a find way to make things happen. You know, and I think that sometimes, you know, we leave with our heart maybe a little too much and in business that can be very dangerous. Yeah. But I think in the overall aspect of business life, um, you know, working with the right people, hiring people that actually care about what you're doing is very, very integral to success with what you have. Yeah, and also when you are in a team environment where it is sales driven, um, how do you make sure that you're all working with each other 
even though you are evaluated on your personal performance? Yes, that's a great question. You know, honestly, the, the competition drives and spurns different journeys that you're allowed to go with here. Obviously, you want to always work with the people that you're with within your company, but, you know, at least within the spine world, it is the most competitive aspect of, of sales that I've ever seen. I mean, you want to get on stage, you want to be in the top 25 in the country, you want to be a part of that president's council, you want to get the Rolex, you know, these, these things, and they do it on purpose to drive you. Yeah. And there's kind of a, it's kind of like a code of the gladiator thing where we'll battle it out on the field, but after that, we know we can hug it out and say that we're still part of the same team. And I think it's just realizing that we have one goal as a collective, as the company, you know, let's be the best, but individually, let's be the best as well. Mm -hmm. and, and so what is it that you've seen um, work for you? And this is, can be from hockey where, yes, you want to be the leading goal scorer, but if your team's not there with you and helping each other out, you're not going to win the game, which is more important than being the best scorer in the league, at least to most people. So right. what, what do you do there? How do you get the team together? You know, it's I was, I was one of those players what you would consider, I guess, a power forward. Um, you know, my last year of junior in Chilliwack, I, you know, I was a 30 goal guy, 30 fight guy, um, played on a, you know one of our most skilled lines, and that kind of transcended in my professional career too. And I was always protecting the the faster, more skilled players, but I was able to still chip in offensively. And you know, that part of of your your teammates knowing that you're there to protect them all the time. Most of the time in the dressing room, you saw a lot of those very grinding, tough-nosed players were the ones that were the adhesive. You know, they were the ones that were keeping the guys together because, you know, you can stray off and be arrogant and, and try and do your own thing. And the bottom line is hockey's a team sport, and most team sports are team sports, obviously, yeah. and tennis and golf and some of these other sports you have to do. But, um, you know, really, it's, just, it's being a man, sitting down and, and, and really figuring out and understanding – the strategizing, what's ahead of you? What are the problems? How do we, how do we problem solve? You know, if, yeah. is there a cancerous person within our dressing room? Well, let's cut that loose. You know, and as, as you get older to the professional ranks, a lot of that stuff dissipates very quickly because there's a lot of guys waiting to get up and chew on your heels and get a new contract. So you, you really, really clear a lot of that stuff out. In junior, it's a little tougher because, you know, there's a lot of good players, but there's really not. And, you know, especially if they're local kids or something like that, you know, it's, it's very competitive, but, you know, the coaches may give them an extra chance or something. Um, I, again, I've been very blessed to be on teams where we were very, very cohesive units. We had a couple problems when I was my first year pro, but we all sat down, we got the leaders together, the nucleus that was the strength of the team. And we figured out, all right, guys, if we're failing here, how do we, how do we get a positive gain here? I mean, you know, you can strategize, you work that out, you, you set your goals internally and externally, and you, and you really just clear that smoke out of the air and you got to move forward. I mean, you can't, you can't look back and keep looking in your rearview mirror. Yeah, I always um, talk about how one bad person in the locker room will hurt the entire team. Absolutely. Um, and, and I'm sure you've seen this in business as well. So what have you done perhaps, or what should leaders do when you have that person who is not, a team player who is it in for themselves and is and you know it is hurting the team well i, I think the biggest thing is communication um you got to talk to that person now we don't know where these guys come from they could come from a broken home there could yeah. have been some major issues that got them there mentally spiritually physically you know they could be playing with an injury and don't want to let anybody know because they don't want to get sent down they don't want to lose a position on the team so i think you know for me as, as a former captain and is understanding, pull them aside, go have a cup of coffee with, with them. You know, find out, hey, what's going on? You know, what's, why do you have a burr up your butt? You know, what, why are you not, you know, falling into the collective of this team? You know, why, what, who are you not getting along with? I um, mean, that stuff, again, transcends into a boardroom. I mean, it's very easy to figure out who the cancerous aspect is within your company. You know, it's, and it, I'll tell you, it's contagious. It's, it's very contagious. I was reading it, um, I can't remember the book that I had had, it was called The 12 Rules. I believe from uh, uh, Jordan Peterson yep. and I was talking about, you know, chaos and, and, and fi fixing chaos through that, but also figuring out, you know, it, it's so easy for that contagion to just destroy and domino effect so much hard work and you've got to nip it in the butt right away. You can't, you can't let it fester. And in a dress room, you cannot let that fester. Is it, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, it'll bring the whole team down very, very quickly. Yeah. What do you tell a leader who knows there's a problem? but does not want to take action because you know he or she is afraid of of making a change too quickly even though we know that that is the right thing to do 
Uh, you know, it's it's that tough love. You know, you unfortunately you got to give it, and yeah, you, you have to supersede. I mean, again, in business, you get to a certain point where you're not going to know what to do. Mm-hmm. And I always say, go hire somebody or consult somebody or ask somebody that knows what you don't. It's okay to ask for help. You know, and as leaders, we have to do that. You know, <clears throat> there's there's a really funny deal I was reading the other day, and it was about serotonin levels, how humans and lobsters share that same value. The higher the uh-huh. serotonin level, the straighter your back is, the, the, the quicker yeah, you are, the you stronger are. you are. The same as male as the male lobsters. Low serotonin levels are the fighters, they die right away in the ocean. With humans, it's the same thing. Early cro magnons ones that were slouchy, low serotonin. As we got more evolved, the serotonin levels became higher, became more aggressive people. And you'll figure those people out that have those low serotonin levels in your room, because they're the ones that are doing this with the bad body language. And you're seeing it, you see it on a basketball court, you see it on the ice, you see it in a, in a, in a corporate setting. You see the guys that are slouching, you see the grim looks on their faces. And when your leaders are doing that, I mean, we got some major issues. So you got to sit down and figure out, can you increase those levels of serotonin in, the, in your leader to help yeah. them be a positive, you know, c- catalyst to create things at a positive level, or sometimes you just got to let them go. You know, the, the learning point is you lose, you learn, you move on. You know, I, everybody's not going to win at the end of the day. You know, you got to, and you have to be able to sacrifice those things for the better of the good. Yeah, I read somewhere where it said a leader is not there for the likes. The right. leader should be respected. 100%. So it's a, it's a great statement. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, I mean, I've, when I was finished with hockey, I actually tried to start the Texas Tech hockey program. We, we, we got into we a club, we pulled them out of club into SGA and really pushed hard to go to Division One. Obviously, Title IX was a major issue, um, but we got really, really close to doing it. And, you know, I coached a lot of really, really good players um, that you would be surprised that would be in Lubbock, Texas, at, at Texas Tech University at that level. Um, and I'll tell you, <clears throat> that that way of figuring you, you want to talk about kids trying to get to a next level and being down on themselves and fighting and fighting and fighting you know we would just sit down with these guys and we we built our leaders to be this massive force within the dressing room you know and these kids became so tight we had some really magical memories with this hockey program but seeing the kids at that level transpond to that and then interjecting you know i was again i was running my consulting company still trying to do this texas tech thing so i was able to take a lot of the business stuff and put it inside to the dressing room until it was kind of like a, a neat little guinea pig experiment. And I'll tell you, these kids just, they, they were all over it. And they love, these guys were all smart, young yeah. college guys that were playing hockey, you know, they're also trying to get their own corporate life going. And they just took it on themselves. And it was just really remarkable to watch. Yeah, my uh, my best speeches in, in corporate settings when I was working um, in corporate were football analogies. Uh-huh. People love them. People just yeah. love, and even if you're not a fan, I think you still understand that it is very applicable. Right. Um, so you know, I think there's a lot of a lot of overlap here, and all the work you're doing with all the young kids is remarkable. Um, so back to your story, uh, Paul. Um, you see, so you you grad or you left uh, hockey. You went to uh-huh. you know this new this, this job. You went to Striker, and then Spine Art uh, is where you are now. Right. You also have your own company, right? Ador Medical. Correct. So I, I've been, I'm kind of in a really neat position with Spiner. Um, you know, they're, I am, it's my passion to work with Spiner. I love, I, again, they're a worldwide company. I think they're one of the biggest up and company, innovative spine companies in the world. Um, they, you know, they're one of the only sterile pack companies. They're, they're kind of transcending sterilization with operating rooms and they're just very, very innovative Swiss technology. And um, we've got a very, very strong US based team. Um, and that's, you know, that's still a very big passion of mine. I, you know, over the years, I've been able to grow a really, really strong network um, throughout mm-hmm. multiple states, even worldwide in Canada and, and, and overseas and in, in the uh, South Asian Pacific area, Australia, New Zealand. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible to still be in this industry, but also on the other side to kind of have a hybrid role where I'm able to, you know, kind of jump into the Matador Medical as well. You know, I was, I was a spine distributor before I did go to, to Spine Art and kind of got back out of that, back into management. And, but we kept Spiner going and now we're, we're in the air technology area. So when COVID hit, it was kind of a, a blessing with timing. Um, you know, we, we saw a, a need and a usage. We were working with a company called Aerobotics that had one of the only really UV machines within the OR that was strong enough to kill 
at the surgical site infection area. And Dr. Kirschman, the founder, ended up finding out that when COVID came, that their machine could actually kill COVID on the first pass in the air. And then you just saw these other remarkable technologies start to follow that. And another one that we carry is uh, a company called Integrated Viral Protection out of Houston, Texas. And these guys have a heated thermal filtration technology. It's just, it's unbelievable. I mean, the stuff kills anthrax in the air, which is submicron to COVID, so it kills everything. So, and you know, there's, there's just really some amazing, amazing technology out there that we're yeah. trying to partner with. Uh, there's a Canadian company out of London called Control Technologies. They've got a, a, a technology piece called the BioCloud. It's essentially a live lab in a box that's mobile or static. And they can detect COVID in the air before it becomes a contagion, essentially. I mean, there's all this data-driven technology out there, and there's really a lot of people not using it and we're using it during the, the height of the pandemic. You know, we contacted a lot of sports teams trying to get this stuff in the dressing room because if you can control the spread in the room from player to player, well, that's that's a pretty big deal. Yeah. You know, you had no fans in the, in the arenas. It was horrible to watch sports during that. You know, but our biggest pride right now that we're doing is we've got two IPs that we're, we're looking to launch. We're in the funding stage right now. Um, that has been an incredible journey of learning. <laughs> it was, you know, I, I really, I put this thing together about 18 months ago on a, on a piece of paper. I essentially got to my highest level of mechanical engineering that I could that I could do myself. And I was able to circle around. I brought one of the kids that I coached at Texas Tech. He's a mechanical engineer, Kevin Mayu. I was able to bring him in and help me kind of bring this thing to the finish line on the technology side. And I can't get into too much right now, but uh, it's going to be really neat. And we are so excited to get, we're getting so close on the funding side for it. Um, and when it happens, you know, it's going to be a pretty special time. And We've got some really great partners and, you know, obviously looking at manufacturing outlooks. We have some connections in India that we're looking and talking with. Wow. And, you know, it's just it's just opened my eyes to a whole different world of startup, of angel funding, um, you know, just uh, entrepreneurship on a whole other side. It's, it's been a really, really neat journey. And this has been all during or after COVID. Yes, correct. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's funny because when exactly two years ago, um, we all thought that um, life as we know it is 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 gone, you know, and we were right. all very sad and and there's change and chaos. But a lot of people that I'm talking to now, and I spoke to somebody this morning, who said COVID is the best thing that happened to them. And right. I'm experiencing something similar to you. It, you know, COVID kind of helped you, propelled you to do all these great things. Absolutely. Yeah, we we didn't slow down. Yeah. So sure. I mean, how do you how do you keep the mindset to always be innovating you in know, this kind of environment? For me, you know, and I, I tell. You know, people that I work with all the time, you got to be fearless. You got to learn. You got to learn to take chances. I think. You know, I, I was listening to one of your podcasts. I think it was with uh, the guy that the Rens, was it Rens, the Rens uh, pet stores. He's Scott the, Arsenal, uh, yeah. yeah, Scott Arsenal, and you know, it's it's about having that that twenty forty year success overnight success. You know, and and that's really what it is. There's there's a guy, a group that we're working with right now. Uh, Joe Milam, he's the head of it, and you got to look him up. He's a best-selling author. Guys are a brilliant, brilliant angel funding, securities, financial guy that's been in the business for over 30 years, and he's got a company called Angel Span, and you know they're going to try and help our IPs get to the next level and cleaning a lot of stuff up that we just don't know about. You know that we're not educated on our side enough, and and having these people like this, you talk about guys that are taking chances and rolling on the dice all the time. I mean, they're essentially creating these incredible algorithms that for values of, of IPs that don't even have one yet. Because there is a value to these ideas, you just got to put it in the right perspective before you present it. So, you know, it's it, we just we just really understood that we can't sit in the home and be a succubus to, you know, to the society, to the government, you know, not waiting for the next stimulus check or something like that, you know. We decided to take advantage of something to help people to create a, a preventative care umbrella or balloon, a barrier, to help people get back to work, to give people protection to have those freedoms and independence, to start actually to travel again, you know, to, to sit down in your office and not worry about somebody coughing or sneezing and freaking out, you know? Yeah. It's just really the simple things. You know, I remember when I was working with Spine Art, I had to go cover a surgery in Denver, and it was probably right at the height around May, two years ago. And it was the first, I got on the American Airlines flight, I was the only person, in the, it was me and three people on the plane. On the plane? Yeah, yeah land, you know Denver's airport. It's an absolute zoo. Yeah. We got there, and it was like a Walking Dead episode. I mean, there was like nine or ten people in the airport. It was so eerie and bizarre. And then get you know get get my get my national rental car, drive downtown Denver. It was like a ghost town. I, I mean, was, it was 20, crazy. 20, 20. It was nobody was there. No, the downtown it was, was unbelievable. Dead. 
Right. You know, then we yeah. get to the hospital and it was, again, minus, you know, their COVID floors and everything yep. else. You know, there's procedures that still had to get done. There's traumatic issues that were still going on. People were still having strokes. People were still having, you know, neuropathy mm -hmm. and spine issues where these guys still had to work. And you had a lot of surgeons that were frustrated because, you know, on one side you're seeing the media really throw this heavy, heavy propaganda of, you know, oh my God, don't, you know, don't step foot outside. And well, there's still a real life out there. There's still people that got to work and then be active, you know? And it was just, it's a really, it was a difficult time. And I think none, none of us in our generation will forget. Um, our kids, they maybe maybe not understand it fully till maybe a decade down the road, yeah. but it was a very bizarre and tumultuous time. But you know what? It, like you said, it, it really opened my eyes to what more can we do? We, we can't sit down. We can't be idle. We got to get out there. We got to be great white sharks. We got to take care of business. And if you're not growing, um, what else are you doing? Right. Exactly. How do you so how do you rebound when you do fail, Paul? I'm sure you fail along the way multiple times in the past few years. Oh man, it's 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 hard. You know, it's I'll tell you, I've been in the, you know a couple of different scenarios, even just with with our IPs. You know, on the weekends when I'm working through it, and you know, it's like, are we going to get to the finish line? You know, mm -hmm. um, even with you know, Drew, you want to talk about hard times? I mean, I've got very good friends of mine that run very very large multi million dollar distribution centers for spine and orthopedics and biologics. I mean, when COVID hit, their businesses got shut down. I mean, hey, you talk about making, you know, anywhere from a hundred thousand to two million dollars a month, and then to zero. You've got X amount of employees that you have to pay. You know, the you reality overhead. of that. Oh, man, it was. I mean, just destructive. You talk, and I tell you, I've got some friends of mine that I applaud at such a high level for just putting their their army helmet on, rolling their sleeves up, taking care of their employees and going to work every single day and figuring out something to do to help out their crew. You know, we essentially did the same thing. For me, it was, I mean, it got depressing at times. You're sitting at home, you're not, you know, you're, I would try to go to my office. I mean, I remember one time I was at my office and somebody walked by and you know, like called somebody and complained that I wasn't at home. And it's like, it was getting to a, oh, such no. a crazy point of hysteria that, um, you know, it was, it was massively depressing. And for me, it was really, I read a lot. Um, I try to just kind of pique my mental interest on that side of it. And I, I'll tell you, I'm very blessed. I've got a really strong crew of friends here in Texas, um, very successful guys, you know, attorneys, real estate guys, um, you know, designer guys, guys that were woodworking that have, you know, have created a, a massive business structure within this area. Um, just big entrepreneurial guys that work in automation and, and, and medical and healthcare and, and, and banking, you know, so I, surrounding myself with them and meeting with them and all of us really working together to get out of that slump and figuring out, you know, what's the best thing that we can do? Yeah. You know, yeah. there's a very supportive family source as well. You know, my, my wife's in medical as well. And, uh, you know, she went through a, the same stuff. So both of us were in this 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 horrible grudge match of, of really insanity in an everyday lifestyle. And I mean, our kids just, you know, they just kind of cruise along, just not even really understanding what we're even trying to go through. But I'll tell you, man, we, we just woke up every day and figure out a way to do it, you know? And, and you just, you could not sit idle. You had to get up and do something, whether it was, you know, up in your workout regimen to clean your mind that way, getting mm -hmm. up with some fresh air, calling some of your friends, asking, hey, what are you doing today? Like, how are you getting through your day? You know, I think a lot of that communication was very, very healing on that side of it and definitely kept the motivation moving forward. Yeah, I, I think what we realize as a collective, you know, leadership group that I've spoken to is that the importance of people and support systems is really important, even more important than we gave it credit before the pandemic. Absolutely. Yep. Um, having the right people around you, your family, um, your spouse, your friends, your, your at least colleagues that you can, you can trust. It right. is really super important. Um, one one more question for you, Paul. Um, you know, I think you're a big. You're into sales. Um, you know, you're you got your own business. You're selling, but not not even once in this podcast did you talk about sales. You talked about relationships. Is right. that the secret to sales? I, I think it's ninety eight percent of sales. One hundred percent. You know especially within my medical where I think it's in all sales facets, yeah. um, whether you create a relationship in two seconds and you're able to, you know, sustain that relationship, it's really, it's getting that trust, um, you know, making the people understand that you're going to do the best that you can every day for them. And, and really selling yourself starts within your own company. 
you know, you've got to sell yourself to your employees as much as you do yourself. You know, they, they want to look up to you and be, you know, you're the, you're the big Lebowski. You're the guy that's, that's taking care of business all the day. You're the guy that's yep. shoulders are straight all the day. You're the one always smiling and giving the pats on the backs, you know, and making that stuff happen. And if you can't create with a relationship, you can't create that door to open it to a sale. And it's so, but you can read as many sales books as you want. You can take as many sales seminars as you want. The bottom line is if you cannot have enough gusto to go and open the door, take a couple of no's to get a yes, and to build that 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 camaraderie and to build that rapport and have strength in your in your walk and your talk, that people are gonna figure you out real quick, especially if you got a tough customer. They yeah. want the tough sales guys, they want the guys that are in their relationship. Because there's a lot of guys out there that will do it. You know, I think it's it's imperative that that relational piece is in place. Absolutely. That's amazing. Well, Paul, how can everybody watching and listening get in touch with you, learn more about what you're doing, and perhaps reach out to you for collaboration or even business opportunities? Yeah, so we we can uh, we, our email is info at mattermedical.com. Um, we've got uh, we're on LinkedIn. Um, web web page should be coming soon. We're working on some of the e-com stuff right now. It's just been a big journey for us because we've been switching switching products in and out. Um, but it's, yeah, just LinkedIn, it can show my, my backgrounds there. Um, emails, info at matadormedical.com. Um, and again, the, if you go to our, our LinkedIn page on Matador, there's, there's also a, a toll free number that can be reached. So we'll, we'll get direct, direct, we'll get you directly, excuse me, to the right person within our team, including myself. Um, yeah, we open to talk to people all the time. Uh, we're always open to coaching and consulting and, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been great and very, very blessed to be where I'm at today. And we still got a lot, a lot of fight left to get to where we're going to go, but uh, at least we can wake up another, get another day and do it and do it. Well, all the best to you, Paul. I'm excited to see where you guys go and I'm sure you're going to do some big things. And if you're in Dallas, uh, please hit me up. Love to love chat you. with a fellow Canadian. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate it, man. I love the show. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care.